Manassas Foundation. Welcome to the Quarantine Tapes, a daily podcast from Onassis, LA, and Dublin. Hosted by Paul Holden Graber, this series chronicles shifting paradigms in the era of social distancing. Hello, hello, is this Jory Graham? Hello, what a pleasure to have you on the line, Jory. Thank you so much for being part of the quarantine tapes. Tell me, where, where do I find you and how have you been spending these seven or eight months of this delirious moment in our lives, this pandemic? Did you say delirious? I said delirious or dire or dark or I don't know how you want to qualify it. You qualify it. I don't even, I'm at a loss of words. I, you find me in my kitchen. In your kitchen? Um, in Massachusetts, in the northeastern United States, in the northern hemisphere. <laughs> in the, <laughs> This sort of reminds me of of, of a, a wonderful passage in in Georges Perec, where he he describes where where he is, and it it goes from 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 the world to his table. Well, um, delirious sounds like a fantastically inappropriate word, but wonderfully it re- inappropriate. It reminds me of a prior world in which um, delirium was something to be even aspired to. <laughs> yeah. Now we are just desperate for, uh, just desperate to restore something that would resemble resemble a, a consensus reality of any kind. So um, the eccentric feelings of del- delirium really do correspond to a prior world order. Or as you said in your wonderful text to me, um, in another era, at the end, now we are at the end of an error. You know, it was wonderfully <laughs> auto-corrected, but I love the idea of that we are at the end of an error. I found myself thinking, are we an error? Yeah. That is a really great question. Were we a mistake uh, in evolution? Were we like a catastrophic mistake? And it could have been, been uh, much better if uh, we had evolved. Uh, differently, and perhaps not our species taking hold at all. Who knows? But um, you, you know, your, your ruminations make me think about so many things. First of all, it wasn't an autocorrect. I meant it. Um, you know, the end of an era, E R R O R. I, I really meant it. Um, and one. Oh, that's fabulous. And no, and 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 Jory. Um, when I when I wrote this, I was thinking, but really, is it the end of an era or? Are we going to go back to what passes for normal? Oh, well, you meant the end of the era of this current presidency, because we are actually speaking um, just a few days after this uh, election in the United States. So uh, the small error, um, if you will, I, I meant, of course, I interpreted it immediately as just my want to mean the entire development of the human race. Yes, um, I meant it that and, way uh, too. I meant it that way too. <laughs> I meant it both in terms of something de pointu, something that is now, and and perhaps a larger topic. It reminds me of a conversation I once had with the filmmaker and director Werner Herzog, which was called, Was the 20th Century a Mistake? Well, I love Herzog. I learned a great deal from him. I... Uh, I also learned a great deal from from, uh, from Antonioni, a very different kind of a sensibility. But I would say that, I mean, my question would be, not the 20th century, but was the agricultural revolution a mistake? Um, were we probably at our height as hunter-gatherers or maybe... Um, and, and actually, when you read uh, Harari's uh, Homo sapiens, I think it's just called sapiens, um, he makes a very good case, although he doesn't make it overtly, but implicitly he makes an extraordinary case for the disaster of the agricultural, um, the advent of agriculture, of settled agriculture, and how, um, you know, he describes the, not only the, the vivid and extraordinary variety of life um, that, that um, humans had as hunter-gatherers, but how, you know, the uh, the, settle, the settling into agricultural 
um, uh, not only into agriculture, not only gave rise, obviously, to the things that we know it gave rise to, such as civilization as we know it, and uh, religions and city structures and um, everything that settled human uh, managed to invent, including extraordinary art and um, systems of belief, um, the discoveries of all sorts of things that we've come to prize, I think we have, such as um, you know, mathematics and philosophy, but also the, you know, it's extraordinary to, to, to read the book and realize that how few illnesses existed um, of body or mind. Right. How, um, and what a different sense of futurity um, one had to live with, the kinds of anxieties that set in as soon as one depended on a crop um, and on the, um, the, the need for regular seasons and the return of rain and the return of, of, uh, of sustainable seasons. And then, of course, needing to uh, enslave people to work fields, to feed people, to, you know, the whole cycle that sets in motion. And um, one of the most romantic, the described passages in that book is the life of the hunter-gatherer. And I've gone back and we read that chapter many times to think, you know, was there another way to evolve out of that moment than the one we took? And we seem so much in this moment um, where we see the outcome of so many disastrous inventions of our own that we, such as the technologies that we live with, uh, and we keep telling ourselves it's all progress. One must accept progress. It's inevitably the right direction. And look at the cul-de-sacs, look at the dead ends, look at the places we found ourselves. We don't know our way out now. So that's where we are in this error that you call it, I think. And yes, um, I, that's a great book. I think people should read that book, Sapiens. You know, but it, 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 since we were talking about Werner Herzog in in um, in that conversation, and generally speaking, Werner speaks about that very problem of um, what happened when we were no when we became sedentary. What happened? He speaks about tourism being sin and walking, uh, uh, um, traveling by foot being really the way to, to experience the world. And it, it truly, it, it truly resonates with very much of what you said. But I'm, I'm glad you, you found amusement in, in, in that word era as I used it. You know, I'm, I'm a linguistic monster. I grew up in so many different countries with so many different languages and, um, knowing your work and appreciating it for, for decades now, I was taken by one sentence that I, I, I read in preparing to speak with you, Jory, where you say, I've always felt like a bit of a voyeur in America. Can you unpack that a little bit, and perhaps even in the present circumstances we find ourselves in, in this predicament? Um, I mean, I, I grew up in, in Italy, um, and I was trained in French schools, and I went to, to the lycée system and, and ended up at the University of Paris. Um, and, you know, didn't come to the United States except as basically an emigre um, after 1968 uh, in, in Paris. So uh, I always felt a little bit of the sensation. I mean, the, you know, the voyeur, the flaneur, right. the, uh, right. the, the cast a cold eye on life and on death. Um, uh, you know, take a you know the, the certain distance that you have in order to have vision. Um, those are all related conditions. But I did grow up as a voyeur on the archaic, on um, the Etruscan, on the Roman Empire, on um, the rise and fall of it. After all, I grew up playing in the Roman Forum as the sort of place I would play after school as a child. I grew up among you know three thousand years of, uh, of of continuously inhabited. Um, and settled human artifacts and institutions and um, rising and falling belief systems. Uh, but Italy is peculiar in that um, it's, it's a very it's a very small landscape on which a great deal of history has occurred, and so it has a very vertical pull if you live in it. Because if you have an imagination and you're a child um, and you are told the story of the foundation of Rome or everything that came before it, um, it's not only very vivid, it feels simultaneously present. So to be in that, the most recent layer of it, uh, the present tense of something which is so vertically uh, alive and um, visible in, you know, any time you take a walk down the streets of Rome, um, 
is, uh, is to feel that just to be alive in the present is to be a voyeur on the past. And, uh, and, uh, and to be asked to be um, uh, a voyeur in the sense of someone who attempts to have vision into the future because you feel like you're on a very small cusp of time um, that inherits all of the decisions made by humans throughout history leading up to the moment that you're in in which, you know, in, in, in which you are responsible um, if you're alive for the future decisions which will be made. As a child, I wasn't as aware I, as I am now of, you know, the degree to which the, the responsibilities might be to the earth itself and to the planet. As a, you know, as a young person, I was uh, more involved with the, uh, with the idea of what political or um, cultural responsibilities you know, one might have at, at this point. It's become much more a sense of obligation and responsibility to other species and to the planet itself. You know, it, it's it, the reason I was also asking you that question is because it's 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 quite a complicated notion. This notion of home, and certainly it is for me, and it, it sounds like it might be for you. And recently, Carlo Ginzburg, the the great Italian historian, sent me a text which I'm not even sure is yet published, but I know he won't mind my reading the first paragraph. It's a text called "The Bond." of shame, and it goes like this. A long time ago I suddenly realized that the country one belongs to is not, as the usual rhetoric goes, the one you love, but the one you're ashamed of. Shame can be stronger bond, can be a stronger bond than love. I repeatedly tested my discovery with friends from different countries. They all reacted the same way, with surprise, immediately followed by full agreement, as if my suggestion was a self-evident truth. I'm wondering how you, you respond to this notion, which I find fascinating, that I suddenly realized that the country one belongs to is not, as the usual rhetoric goes, the one you love, but the one you're ashamed of. Well, you know, first of all, I love the echoes of Proust in the very opening syntax of that sentence. Yes, yes. <laughs> longtemps, longtemps. Uh, but uh, because, because you, you suddenly feel that childhood is, that, is the, one of the first countries um, that you come from. Mm. Uh, and mm. uh, because of the, the echo in that line, mm. it makes you think of that. Um, I would say that the uh, the idea of the nation state is something which I think for me has, um, although it had a very governing influence on my life, given the fact that English is my third language and I grew up in Italy and ended up living in France and um, uh, ended up almost by accident in the United States. But the idea of the nation state as the, as the country that I come from is something that at this point in my life, uh, just the idea of the nation state, is, it's not just that I've come to question it since it, it seems like... A, a, an insanity at this point. It's also our greatest burden and cause of catastrophe. Yes. Um, but, you know, the country of my humanity, of my being human at all, um, is, would be the source. If I had to look for the source of greatest shame, it's also obviously, you know, in the monuments of unaging intellect, as Yates would have it, you know, <sighs> a source of, of inspiration to, to, yeah. Uh, yeah. to have been human. But to feel the uh, trespass, the destruction, the indifference, the stupidity, the uh, ignorance more than stupidity, the, the, the complete um, uh, disregard for a notion of, of just proportion, uh, that the humans are, um, you know, how many planets are we using, uh, the resources of how many planets are we using at any given moment as we continue to live as we do on this planet. Um, so it, it is a source. I mean, shame is not operative because other species, you know, uh, have no use for our shame. And mm -hmm. shame cannot be hopelessness because it will render one, render one incapable of action. And shame cannot be the self-indulgence of um, something that one, by admitting to it, can step free of either. So it's a complicated idea, this idea of shame. Um, you know, it, it's, um, it's a kind of shadow that one casts, that one must uh, understand is, you know, one, one must set free of, but one cannot set free of. So I think it's an important motivator, Shane. Um, but I don't feel that about a nation state, Paul. 
I think that's a more, I mean, if I was still a European, and I think I've become <laughs> an you, American but, but over you, the years. But you are, but you if, are. But if I was still an actual <laughs> European, if I was living in the midst of those contested lands as I did when I lived in France, right. I mean, then then I would feel it very radically and very, and the, the, the terms would make very much sense to me because there is not a country or a field in Europe which wouldn't make you feel that in relation to some other country or field, um, that is an emotion that, that um, would be elicited in uh, as an American. Uh, so let's put it this way. Um, we, just, we just had an election. Yes. And when, when the mayor of Paris um, sent the message, welcome back America, I felt um, a, a lifting, a momentary lifting of shame, um, which made me very clear, feel very clearly how responsible um, I was, we all are, for where we are. Um, and when I watched all the church bells in Paris ring mm. in that little video they yeah. sent out, which of course, of course moved me to tears, um, alongside these fantastic images of people dancing in the street all over this country, um, in New York, everyone honking pots and pans in the windows, um, and the way in which we performed with music and with dance and with break dancing and with all sorts of different, extraordinarily diverse you know, Native Americans sitting out of their cars in Albuquerque and just doing incredible victory dances, this, this beautiful uh, melange of what America is. Um, and since we live in an instant technology and everybody was filming it on their phones and putting it on um, social media, the whole world could see this America, which they imagined back, um, dancing in the streets. It was uh, a lifting of a kind of communal grief, shame, fear, whatever you want to call it. Very momentary, I would say. I, we're, we're, I don't think we're out of any woods. Um, but uh, you could you could feel not just the, the, the confinement of the pandemic, but the confinement of these four years of being, of feeling deeply um, h- how profoundly we had become the wrong people, not the people we meant to be. Right. What was also interesting to me was the degree to which, as a European, I understand that, you know, the idea of America is very different than America, um, of the United States, the idea of the United States, I should say. Um, it's very different than the reality of the United States, but how important the imagination of America is to the world. Um, you know, how important it is as a symbolic, um, uh, however um, untrue in many ways, uh, structure it is. And when we performed what the United States looked like in the streets right after the election, um, the, the joy, the beauty, the inventiveness, and the solitariness. I mean, it wasn't just that people were dancing and because they were masked and they were being careful in their social distancing up to a point. Um, they, but they, you could feel that part of what was exciting was that, you know, a democracy which is defined by each private vote being individually counted. And, you know, one of the incredible things that we watched was... They, we are always told every vote counts, but we watched in these very close races, every single vote counts. So the idea of the individual and their individual vote and their individual dance on the street uh, and their individual singing and it was just beautifully enacted for the world. And the feeling that we might be let back into the community of nations um, as an idea, uh, that we might not have failed them utterly, was momentarily visible and possible to us again. And, uh, and one of the things I've been thinking about is the difference between that kind of a crowd and the kind of crowd that is it at these that is at these horrifying rallies that we watch um, uh, Trump hold, and uh, what the difference is between the mob mentality where everyone is swaying in unison to this one force that is driving through them, um, so that their individuality is lost and sort of a mob consciousness takes hold, not just in those rallies, but in the dark web where mob consciousness takes over in terms of conspiracy theories, um, belief systems, all the things that, uh, you know, Dr. Goodberg should be tried at the Hague for, for what he's done to, the, to, to, the, to this country and to the planet. But, um, you know, th- there was something about the individuals were dancing individually, each and together. Right. In the streets of our cities, as opposed to being moved in unison right. um, by an idea that um, was destructive. And I started thinking about, um, you know, Kennedy in his book, Crowds and Power. Power yes. Yeah. And, um, and uh, you know, the, the, the feeling of 
the way that when he talks about there's nothing, somewhere he talks about how there's nothing that a man fears more than the touch of the unknown or even the touch of another human. He talks about the repugnance of being touched that people feel and how they go into crowds that in order to become free of this fear of being touched. I'm not sure if I'm if I'm, I'm quoting this correctly, but it's close to this. I mean, it, you know, talks about it's right, went in the nets, but how in a crowd it's as if suddenly it's as though everything is happening to one and the same body, which is really different, you know, than and the fear of being touched applies to poetry. I mean, when we say, well, we hope that a poem touches you. Yes. It is. When, we can, when Keith talks about, like, reaching out and touching you with his hand, you know, the, the, the lyric moment is a single voice singing alone out of an individual, you know, the Orphic moment of the song of the individual lyric poet, and that dancing in the streets with each individual freely having, with his one vote, dancing freely in, in, in a lyric individuality in um, a communal, huge communal gathering, right. but each free and individual, as opposed to, very visibly as opposed to, the mob um, wearing the identical hat, moving in this identical way, and these, uh, you know, through which these, these um, you know, everything happening as if to one and the same body, I think Kennedy says, and that terrifying way in which, um, you know, William Carlos Williams has an amazing poem in which he talks about that. Um, I think it's called The Crowd at the Ball Game. And um, he says, uh, the crowd at the ball game is moved uniformly by a spirit of uselessness, which delights them out. Of course, the ball game is quintessential American types of recently been reading Underworld by DeLillo with an incredible feeling of what it is to be at the at the American baseball game. All the exciting detail of the chase and the escape, the error, the flash of genius, all to no end, save beauty, the eternal. So in detail, they, the crowd, are beautiful. And you think, fine. And then this next line there, for this to be warned against, saluted, and defied. And then he's been calling the crowd, which is a sum of individuals, they. Like, as I was describing, many individuals making up the crowd. And it's at that moment in the poem where he switches from they, calling the crowd, they, the crowd, to it. So he says, that, so in detail, they, the crowd, are beautiful for this to be warned again, saluted, and defied. It is alive, venomous. It smiles grimly. Its words cut. The flashy female with her mother gets it. The Jew gets it straight. It is deadly, terrifying. It is the Inquisition, the revolution. It is beauty itself that lives day by day in them idly. This is the power of their faces. It is summer. It is the solstice. The crowd is cheering. The crowd is laughing in detail, imminently, seriously, without thought. And, you know, I find myself in that poem. You move from uselessness to idly, okay? There's a spirit of uselessness, which is a positive, you know, freedom, to idly, which is what you talked about when you talked about an engine also, right? Idling. Yeah, yeah. The feeling and the way in which it turns into everything that is terrifying, Inquisition, you know, the, the, the Jew gets it straight, the, the, the Inquisition, the revolution, and then, but still, it is, the, it is this thing in nature that, you know, the beauty itself is complicated. And as you read the poem, you feel yourself get into the grip of this it that's repeated endlessly ahead of the crowd. And then back, you let back out as an individual, going, are you, are you free of the crowd? Are you an individual? You know, are you free? <laughs> and that's, I think now we have to figure out, we have seem to have 70 million people who are in crowd emotion, you know, and 70 million odd people, more than 80 million, who knows, but not finished the count, but we're trying to get out of group, crowd, dark web, internet, think, and into individual, take responsibility, take risks, rise up again and be, um, you know, free, think. And it's a, it's a complicated struggle going on. Yeah, and you know, when you said perf when they were performing, um, I, I think it was a really sincere performance, and it was also a release um, the, 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 such joy and uh, around the world. Um, it, it felt like you know we we had gotten to a punchline that we all could could understand. And you've written something that I really I really like so much, where you 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 talk about imagination and extinction. And you I know you're also so interested in the notion of oblivion. You say, what is the imagination supposed to do with its capacity? to imagine the end 
is the imagination of the unimaginable possible and, perhaps, as I have come to believe, might it be one of the most central roles the human gift of imagination is called upon to enact. How do these words of yours resonate with you at this very moment, Jory? No, that was a nice quote. Yeah, it was. Um, it, was. <laughs> it, it, it actually was yours, but I'm glad you agree with yeah. me. I'm, a glad, I'm glad you agree with me. I'm glad I agree with it, too. I'm <laughs> <That's>, glad I agree with it. You never know. Uh, everything keeps changing. Of course. Um, I mean, the last, the last four books have been a project, especially this new one, Runaway, it's been a project um, involved with imagining the unimaginable, which is a very complicated, it sounds simple, but... It, it's a complicated practice. Let's just call it a practice. Um, one of the things that has always interested me is, uh, is this practice that the originates, I believe, with the Iroquois nation of um, making decisions at any given moment um, based on what the seventh generation ahead of the current questioners, what would be best for those people. And, you know, one of the examples given is, you know, the, the, the leader, the chieftain, the person in charge of the decisions for the community would walk along, say, the riverbed, deciding how much fish to take from the river, uh, imagining that they're holding the hand of the seventh generation and saying, how much fish should we take from this river so that you will have fish seven generations from now? What's always interested me about that, and this is just to answer the you know, about the sensation of what we would mean about unimaginable is that it's hard it's easy for us to imagine um our children their lives and our children's children perhaps but uh increasingly we have a very hard time imagining further than that in terms of futurity i think i always feel you know that the Christopher Lash's The Culture of Narcissism was a great book that people could reread because although it looked at the saving patterns of, of Americans, it really did describe the collapse into more and more into presentism, as we call it. So people were unable to really think about people that would live um, who would, to whom they were not intimately connected or to whom they could not imagine a direct cord of communication. So that three generations or four from now, those people are unimaginable to us. We can't bring them to mind as real people. So we will not make sacrifices on their behalf. We will not change our way of living on behalf of people. We might on behalf of our children. That's always the plea. Will you do it for your children and your grandchildren? But will you do it for future humans who you do not yet know exist, which somehow was a state of mind, which was seven generations was automatic. The people much wiser than us who inhabited these lands before we committed genocide upon them. You know, they were able to think about time and why were they able to think about the future as a deep future in that way that was so intimate that they were able to make decisions about everyday things? in communication almost directly with people whom they could imagine that we cannot, but partly because the imagination of the future mirrors our capacity to imagine the past. And um, they were capable of keeping ancestors in mind. Um, and as long as you can keep layers of ancestors awake behind you through rituals, through storytelling, through the inheritance of ways of believing, um, experience, uh, memory. Um, you know, I've always felt that it was a mirror. However many generations behind you, you can keep in your present generation um, by the many means that humans have devised to do so, uh, which is what most of art and civilization is really about, keeping ancestors, um, ancestral stories, ancestral belief systems, the past awake that is mirrored by how much of the future we can keep away. And we've managed to collapse both sides of that into a kind of place where we um, cannot imagine um, very far in either direction. So part of my thinking about imagining the unimaginable is not just the unimaginable could happen, the terrible thing could happen, we could go extinct, we could destroy the planet, we could kill everything on it, you know, that kind of unimaginable, but also the simple imagination of our obligation to, the, you know, we're only temporarily um, alive in this sense on this planet, but we have in custody extraordinary, um, what we would call creation, um, on, on behalf of future people, and, to, you know, the work that it takes now to 
convince other humans that they are here temporarily, something that humans knew for a very long time, but somehow managed to extinguish in themselves. There's the feeling of being here temporarily, of being custodians of something, you know. I mean, imagine the building of any large cathedral in Europe. Some cathedrals took uh, 900 years to build. Fathers and sons and grandsons and, you know, generations and generations of masons worked on sharks, okay, it's they, you know, forever. Um, and the idea that you would see it finished in your own lifetime was not something that you even thought was possible because you wouldn't. Yeah. Um, but, and yet you participated in the project of creating this thing that you knew maybe down the line, many generations from now, would be completed. And it wasn't as if that was too slow. That was what life was like. Um, you knew how to husband animals or um, rotate fields because you knew that these fields had to yield uh, for people long after you were gone. You couldn't use up the the, uh, the, the uh, nitrogen or the power of the earth in that field by over over planting it and over stressing that land. I mean, it, it's on every level. Um, libraries, um, uh, architecture, it doesn't matter where you look. We were capable of imagining that we were custodians of something in transit through it creating something, you know, institutions, belief systems, we believed in education because we believed that many generations from now, people um, that we helped, you know, we paid it forward, education. Now we are presentists. We live in this tiny sliver of time um, so that uh, the decisions that we make are by definition selfish. They only involve the self we know. They right. don't involve the mystery of unknown other selves. And it, bring, it brings... Other times, it, other it, future it, 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 br- it brings to, to mind um, the general impatience one might feel at this moment. You know, it always reminds me of this wonderful line of, of Benjamin quoting, actually, Paul Valéry, where he says, man no longer works at what cannot be abbreviated. Could you repeat that? I couldn't hear it clearly. Benjamin, in an essay, quotes Paul Valéry. I heard that, but in men, men this ma, is part of the Yeah, I'll, I'll say it again. I really want you to hear it because it, I think it will. It might resonate with you, Jory. He says, "Man no longer works at what cannot be abbreviated." I can't understand the word. Man can no longer. What's the verb there? Abbreviate it. No, no, no. Man can no longer work? Yeah, man can no longer work at what cannot be abbreviated. Ah, man can no longer work at what cannot be abbreviated. Exactly, yes. But, you know, what we mean by um, abbreviation is so interesting. Because one of the things about the pandemic, since you started these these, uh, these conversations during the pandemic, these, this part of them. Yes, I did. Um, is that the dilation of time, because we've not had to move in space quite so much, um, although we've been overworked in terms of having to communicate virtually. We've also had this sort of di- these opportunities for dilation of um, our sense of temporality. I think many people have experienced it in many different ways. And uh, some people have experienced it because they've spent much more time with their children or their families or alone or capable. They've had time to recover daydreaming. They've actually had time to recover in in spite of the fact that we are overwhelmed by Zoom. But they've had a chance to recover wasted time. Right. And this in that wonderful wait um, of time is this unbelievable richness of, you know, that, that wonderful American folk expression, which is life is what happens while you're making plans. Yes. Okay. There's this sense of in, in these wastes of open time where usually one is so busy that in the sidelong glance, in the thing one notices rushing from one thing to the other, yes, one's peripheral psychic and emotional and spiritual vision picks up information, which is always the mystery of adventure and does enter one's consciousness and change where one was going. But it has to be done quickly and serendipitously. Now we've had the opportunity to um, be taken off the path onto what is potentially not a path, but a journey, which is partly what going off the, the you know, our regular path takes us. I mean, the, the pandemic is a journey. The pandemic is, in the old sense of the word, an adventure. The pandemic is a, a, a path into the unknown, 
and it's um you know it's an inward it's a path that goes inward and it's a path that goes outward i mean it's altering the course of our history it's altering for many people the course of what their family structure is 250,000 people have lost family members um it's also altering our sense of what time is like um not just for our own personal lives, but what is a lifetime? You know, we're living in a kind of duende. Any of us could die at any moment. That's right. Um, there's something in the air around us. You know, you can wash your vegetables and your groceries, and you can wipe all the surfaces and wear the gloves and the masks, but it is sort of like a medieval awakening of the fact that you at any moment could be singled out and taken from your life into this horrific exclusion from your life, not necessarily only into your death, but also into the kind of, I mean, I, you know, I, the moment of diagnosis is so usually like a, a wake up call for most people in, with any illness. And it's amazing how much, you know, if you've been, I've been in cancer wards because I've had cancer. And when you are around people who, who talk about the moment they got their diagnosis, um, it's, it's interesting how automatically people move to the language of spiritual um, thinking or vocabulary or um, enlightenment or um, any kind of Zen awakening. Because you, you suddenly realize um, the things I was saying before that, you know, your existence is only one, that it's brief, that, um, you know... <sighs> That if your life is not, uh, you know, what you thought it was, and to just leave it at that, that simple, that your life is something else than you thought it was, and maybe you were alongside your life. You know, we spend a lot of time um, trying to go around life rather than going through it. We spend a lot of time trying to avoid the experience. Um, and when you were talking about the information technology earlier, I mean, a lot of what we do is we try to bypass um, the slow acquisition of knowledge in order to have the short abbreviated the shortcut to the acquisition of information you know information is not knowledge and it most certainly is not wisdom and so part of what people are learning is in this very slow dilated time where they suddenly see you know you, so many people are doing things with their hands that they haven't used their hands in so long you know um it's funny to read about all the baking and cooking but yeah um but you know it has a, a, a huge uh, has a secret text, all this, right. this touching, right. making your own food, feeding your own family. It's as if people are, you know, we were talking about going back to the hunter-gatherer right. experience, like going back to those right. earlier experiences. Right. People are sitting around and they have no choice. They talk to each other. And, Imagine you know, that. Certain, Imagine that. Yeah. And then they, one of the things that children ask so often, I hear it from my friends, is they ask, tell me a story about, you know, when you were young. Tell me a story about my grandfather. Tell me a story and part of the people who've lost people, you know, they sit with their family and now they tell stories about their their ancestors. I mean, I find it um, it's been an interesting, and my mother died at the very onset of COVID. She didn't die of COVID, but in Italy, in Umbria, um, in February. And it was um, very painful because I had not been able to go back to Italy to uh, properly um, bury her. And... Um, I watched the Italian country that I know so deeply um, react to the death of so many people. And one of the things that was so interesting to me was they kept talking about, first of all, 90-year-olds being taken from their homes, from their beds where their spouse was, you know, left behind and uh, how tragic it was. And I kept thinking, wait a minute, people remember this. They are in their 90s and they're living at home together. They're not in a retirement home or old age homes. There are no, there are very few of such things in places like Italy. People live with their families or at home. Okay, so first that. Then um, people kept talking about the elders are dying and all the knowledge that's dying with them. All the know-how, mm. the guys who know exactly how to potare an olive tree, you know, how you, in wet weather, you, you know, branches, you, you put the upper branches that go vertical, and in dry weather, the ones that go horizontal, then you have to, you know, trim the branches to the width of a swallow's wing. I mean, those people with that knowledge, people who know how to find water in land where there's no water, I mean, it's a huge amount of The people who know how to teach opera the way nobody else does, from every level of uh of a um, of, uh, stratum of, wi of wisdom. Um, wisdom was being lost. And then I looked at this country and people kept referring to them as the elderly. Not the elders, but the elderly. And they that's were mostly a, dying. Uh, that's such an interesting distinction you just made. I've never thought of it, Jory. The and they're, they're the thrown distinction away. Distinction between this elderly and elder. It's so interesting. Yes, the elders are it's, the ancestors. I know, it's so interesting. 
And this will live with me forever. And the elderly locked away in these places. You know, yes, people were very sad. They were looking through glass at them. You know, it was terrible. But it was also that they had already been sequestered because as long, I mean, America has in particular this fixation on um, Youth. The, the, the earlier stages of life as being vastly more valuable than the later stages of life. Right. So that you can basically put away the elderly in places where they are only with other elderly. I mean, this is not everywhere. Obviously, there are many families where this is not the case. But it, with my mother, who died at 97, we would have been hard-pressed to find a retirement home to put my mother in. And part of the culture um, in, in Europe is all about making sure that the grandparents are talking to the grandchildren all the time. And right. they help raise them because they have something to pass on. And the idea that we think we sequester these people because we're done with them. The consumer capitalist model of the elderly, as opposed to the wisdom and knowledge acquisition model of the elders. I mean, I would have so many times friends saying, Tutta la sapienza, all the knowledge is gone. You know, what are we going to do without the sapienza? But what, what's interesting to me in, in what you're saying, Jory, is that perhaps this moment um, will remind people that there's a different way of living that there's another way of breathing. I, I hope you're right. I think we are the most, you know, Kurt Anderson has this wonderful book called Fantasy Land. Um, and uh, I, I think that we are the most amnesiac society. Um, you know, hurricanes, storms destroy us and we forget about them instantly and we rebuild. I mean, we, we just, we have very little capacity to, you know, alter our ways and learn from, we tend to just, I mean, my fear is that the pandemic, will, when it disappears, will close over and disappear and will act as if it never happened, happened and we won't yeah. learn anything. Yeah, I mean, of course. The same thing, I mean, I hope to God that the Trump era will end. I have a, I have a very, very deep-seated fear that we are in a very temporary lull, um, that, you know, we have not made provision um, for a future um, and that we have a kind of temporary breather here with this uh, with, with with this, uh, you know, no, no Senate and um, a reduced House and a president who's going to be made, you know, which 70 million people and possibly a media empire created by Trump are going to assault um, through the dark net. I mean, you know, people are not paying enough attention. And many people are, but I don't think the general public is as aware I mean, I, there's a movie called The Great Hack, another one called The Social Dilemma. Yes. There's a really important movie people should see called Agents of Chaos, which are all about the ways in which, you know, what's being hacked in America is the mind of individuals at their most intimate place when they are, you know, alone with a screen and they go on this journey as they see it, which they believe is out of their own agency and they are guided down paths, rabbit holes or whatever, to belief systems and that they believe they've arrived at on their own, which they trust much more deeply, dopamine-laden um, addictions to these pathways into these conspiracy theories, into these belief systems of, you know, complete micro-targeted insanity that's being fed people, which is almost impossible. What we don't know is how do you get people back from that addiction and from the, from the very severely clung to belief systems that they've arrived at through this sort of addicted path right. into the dark web. Well, it's not know. as easy as propaganda. It's not as easy as, you know, you, you if you haven't gotten there by means that are reasonable because algorithms have micro-targeted you and brought you into a place where they've created predictive behavior that you will then become, how do you use reason to, or fact, or description or argument to bring people back from those belief systems. I don't think we've confronted the fact that um, we have many, many, many citizens who are no longer reachable by most of the means we have. Um, uh, uh, by you know, and they're not reachable by fact or by persuasion or by even illumination. Or you can, it, 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 and it's because if you. If you read Shoshona Zuboff's The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, it's a long version, very, very good book. Um, suggest people maybe start with part two and part three as a three-part book. Um, but uh, Timothy Snyder's The Road to Unfreedom, another brilliant book from a different perspective, historian's book on this. But again, those three those three films, The, the Great Hack and The Social Dilemma, and then the, the two-part Agents of Chaos, I mean, we are 
you know, using technology, which is more addictive than any drug we've ever had, to draw people into um, uh, an impo- QAnon belief system, which itself is a long conversation to try to figure out why do the coordinates constantly lead us to the, um, on every level, to sexual abuse, child trafficking? Why is it always about children? Why are the belief systems that, you know, these, these uh, well, you know, why is Pizzagate about, you know, child trafficking underneath the pizza parlor? Like, what is it about um, the obsession with the unborn or the born child that is driving these, you know, everything from pornography to the, uh, the crazy political beliefs? Um, probably unconsciously the idea that we are taking the future away right. um, completely from people and the people where you see it most unconsciously visibly is in the child who's it, it's their future that you're taking away so i'm not sure but i mean it's interesting that always comes down to um the obsession with uh, the uh, the assault is on uh, the innocence our own innocence our you know our future at any rate it, we don't have a solution to how you how you bring people back from those addictions. And, you, and until we do, we have an addictive population that's so massive that, you know, it's in that crowd we were talking about. It's in that crowd. It's in that mob. It's a silent, quiet mob created, you know, one person at a time in front of a screen, micro-targeted, and almost impossible to reach with uh, reason. You know, I, I, I recently had occasion to speak to Rua Benjamin, and I quoted to her this line of Thoreau, which seems to me so perfect for this moment, where he says Uh-oh. that men have become the tools of their tools. Yeah. I mean, that's so much what you're talking about. And, and in, in, in many ways, you know, as you speak about this addiction, the, the, what I'm more is thinking about is, you know, how, how does one change one's mind? And a mind is a very hard thing to change, particularly when it's been addicted to those very tools. But jewelry. But it's also. Uh, yeah, go ahead. But if you think about it, wait, uh, it's like, it's not so much the outcome that the tools are. And, and it is very much. I mean, one of the things I would say that's hopeful to me is that there's what we call Generation Z. I've spent a lot of time in the last few years working on some of the films that I was talking about and on uh, the political um, work. Um, that I'm just not going to go into here, but but one of the most hopeful things that we have is Generation Z, as we call it. And this is, I mean, a source of great hope, which is the Parkland generation, David Hogue and Emma Gonzalez, and their whole a film coming out, incredible film coming out called Us Kids about this this generation. They not only registered and 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 got people to vote in massive numbers, the tiny margins that we won this election by are due to the black community and this youngest of our generation. But the most important thing is that that generation um, is one third of the largest demographic generation, probably since the baby boomers. And another third of that generation is going to turn 18 very soon, hopefully in time for the midterms. And another third of it will turn 18, um, probably in time for the next election. So we have a gigantic body of young people. And one of the things that they've managed is that these are the young ones who have decided to use the technology we're talking about as opposed to being used by it. They have they have withdrawn from some of the um, addictive interactions that the social dilemma awkwardly describes so very well, but still, in terms of filmmaking, it's awkward, um, that... that generations before them have been sucked into. Um, and But the what you were just talking about is, you know, there's a, there's a manner by which you arrive at your own thoughts. If you are reading a book or studying in a class or having a conversation with someone, um, you can lift away from it and feel like, well, this is an opinion. Do I agree with it? But when you are in the very carefully curated, dopamine-triggering, um, targeted um way in which they move you through one piece of news to another by algorithms that target you, that you're not aware of, that are completely invisible, in which if you, because of the very nature of the technology, you push things, you like them, you don't like them, you move through them, you choose them, you choose to enter this room, you you, you know, you feel like you're navigating, the, the, the steering wheel is in your hands, the tools are in your hands, when in fact it's the opposite, but the the, the reason that people created all those interactive tools is precisely so you feel like these are my decisions. I'm arriving at secret knowledge 
step by step down this path that I personally have discovered. And it was hidden from me because the very layering by which you enter the dark web gives people a feeling that they are personally alone with their screen, uncovering things that were hidden from them, which is an entirely, you know, it's a, it's a particular fear to make people feel like their agency is being flattered. They have had the power to uncover. So at that process of arriving at information is quite different than meeting it in the New York Times and, um, or in a book or learning it from an elder or whatever. And I think it's that it's that process which the people who work in this technology now admit to us. They worked so hard to create. They tested it and invented it. As one man says in The Social Dilemma, it's so much more addictive than anything else that, that you've ever encountered. Yeah. There's no drug. Yeah, we, we, and, uh, so. we've become users. I mean, that, that's what, what comes about in, in The Social Dilemma. They speak about this addiction as being a... But our children, yeah. our children, might, uh, our children, Generation Z, and then I don't know what they're going to call the next one, Z plus one, Z plus two, but they're, um, they're awake. I have great confidence in them. They are extraordinary. Um, and if they have... If they can just grow up fast enough to understand that there's going to be compromise involved, they're not going to get everything at once that they want. Um, they are the ones capable of, you know, we're going to have to now move extraordinary with extraordinary rapidity on the climate change issue. Right. Um, we're going to re-enter Paris. It's the first thing we're going to do, but we're going to re-enter Paris in completely altered terms with much stricter um, goals. And, uh, with these young people completely committed to this. And I am, um, we're so lucky to have them. I don't know what was in the water that made <sighs> this gigantic demographic. I'll that, tell you where. Th that's hope. And no, then, that's hope. I mean, that's hope that, that there is. Some... I have very, that's my, that's my source of hope. And the Black Lives Matter kids that, you know, and adults that, that also turned out this vote. I mean, there are communities that are wise and disciplined and passionate and most importantly, are pragmatic. Right. Who made this particular thing happen. They, you know, they're not the ones going, we have to have everything or nothing. Um, and so uh, my, my faith is, is uh, with them. <laughs> In one of your studies, maybe, maybe at the university, maybe on your kitchen wall, you have taped poems, and particularly I, I read of, of Shima Sini. And of course, Sini now is very much in fashion because Biden quotes him. But I'm wondering, is there a poem on any wall that particularly inspires you, that moves you forward, that you feel speaks to this moment or that just speaks to you? I know. What I wanted to be to is something, something very, very different. It wasn't a poem. It's, it's something that I found today. I, uh, I put on Twitter this morning, and um, it just has to do with a kind of, your phone calls have a kind of civility it's from a prior order. When you talk about calling an old friend or an old friend calling, it has to do with, you know, when people check in with each other without anything particular in mind. Um, and it has a kind of respect for the other thing. And I know this is crazy because um, both of the people involved here are people that we don't feel um, that uh, strongly about. Um, but it is a letter left by uh, President Bush Sr. on the res it's a note left by, in his handwriting, left by Bush Sr. Um, to the incoming young President Clinton. Yes. Um, on the resolute desk in the Oval Office. Yes. Um, for him to find when he was inaugurated. And I felt that it was a description of what our democracy is like. You know, it's interesting. Sometimes the vehicle was like, you know, we really didn't like Bush Senior. And many of us ended up not liking Bill Clinton very much. So it has almost nothing to do with the individuals themselves. But this letter dated January 20th, 1993, says, Dear Bill, when I walked into this office just now, I felt the same sense of wonder and respect that I felt four years ago. I know you will feel that, too. I wish you great happiness here. I never felt the loneliness that some presidents have described. There will, be, there will be very tough times, maybe even more difficult by criticism you may not think is fair. I'm not very good one to give advice, but just don't let the critics discourage you or push you off course. You will be our president when you read this note. I wish you well. I wish your family well. Your success now is our country's success. I am rooting very hard for you. Good luck, George. 
and what a good. I way. thought that was yeah, a, it's so it's astonishing because we're sitting here with a man who will not concede, and here is a man who is a, a, also a one-term president, defeated in an ugly fight, who has left his opponent, you know, his the best field he has on on the field of battle for him to use, you know. And uh, when he says you will be our, he underlines the word our, you will be our president when you read this note. And I thought it was an extraordinary thing. I know it's horny and, no, you know, people not, will, not, will rail against you. <laughs> no, but not particularly, not particularly. I think there, there's a, a dignity and civility and the feeling that when we were talking about temporality before and about a nation state and about, you know, what rituals are and what shame is. And there's a feeling of, you know, there's a thing which this moment in history that we happen to be in. Here's this desk and this oval office and I pass through and I'm a ghost and you pass through and you're the next ghost. But what we're serving is not a ghost. Right. It's a land and the people. Something, and bi- something our bigger. Our have forced it. Uh, yes, bigger, but, you know, affects everyone. And so we have to root for each other because, you know, we have to do the right thing. Even if we disagree mightily about what the right thing is, we have to be, you know. I think that's the definition of what we mean by civilized, you know. Um, and uh, I love the word I am rooting hard for you because it has that, just the verb root. Right. You know, we, ha- we have a root in here, you know, and the tree has to grow. And uh, the tree is partly your branching and partly my branching. But if we don't all put the roots in and keep watering it, we don't have a tree at all. So it's, uh, I thought it was uh, a very moving example um, um, of uh, something that we don't have anymore um, in this, what we mean by partisan is a very, that word itself is worth an hour of talking about what do we mean by partisan. Um, but this is just in 1993, not that long ago, when we were paying people. And I don't know that we'll, you know, given the technology and what we have decided progress is made up of. Um, I mean, you know, just to be political for a minute, you can, you know, this might not be part of this conversation, but um, the Democrats ran a race against Donald Trump and Facebook. Um, they ran a race against you know, and in 2016, Cambridge Analytica, Bannon, the Mercers, and Zuckerberg um, worked in a thing called Project Alamo yeah. to micro-target 200 million Americans and change their minds. Um, and we now have all the proof of that. And what's so strange is that people don't mind it. It's like being visited in the night by a succubus, right? <laughs> like having something come into your soul and change your mind. And you were talking before about, you know, all the powerful ways in which this pandemic has changed our minds in ways that, you know, had opened us up and made us open to experience. And then there's this other way in which this, this virus, which is this technology, comes in and infiltrates us and penetrates us and we're somehow not sufficiently frightened by it. I mean, does that make sense to you? Oh, totally, totally. And I'm glad you read that letter. It's a surprising letter for you to read, but in that surprise is something very, um, I, I think, very comforting in the sense that one president could hand over power to another in a way that does speak about a, a democratic process, what we're living through now. The democratic process, but also about how we feel about what time is. I mean, one yes. of the interesting things about this letter, just as a literary document, is it starts when I walked into this office just now. Right. Okay. So you feel like You're the there. very moment he's, it, it, that he's writing the letter, he's awake to it. He says, I felt the same sense of wonder and respect that I felt four years ago. Meaning he's already thinking four years have passed and that wonder in this room is still with me. So he's already talking about an emotion which transcends the ego and which is um, brought to life by being in a kind of temporality which history provides. I mean, when I, that's what I meant about, a little bit about growing up in Rome. When you live in historical time as much as you live in the present, you constantly feel that you're partly a ghost. So there's a kind of inbuilt humility because so many came before you and so many more will follow you. And so is that just now... I felt the thing of four years ago. And then he has his wishes. And then the incredible return to the temporality of the moment in which he's leaving a letter on a desk that has nothing else on it. Right. Which he knows a man in a few hours will walk in and find right there. And he says, you will be our president when you read this note. 
And it's the same activity as the just now. It's like this, it's not just the temporality of, you know, the just now, but the physicality of this note and putting down this physical object on the resolute deck in this, in this place, which is a historical location. And, you know, it will not, it will be here when you pick it up. So your hand will touch my hand via this note. Yeah. And it's a little bit what you do with a poem. I mean, you reach out to the reader and say, you know, um, by the time you read this reader, I might be long dead, but, but, um, but you, but, yeah. um, you know, you will be changed and you will, you know, you will speak for me by the time you read my words. Jory, what, you know, I, Jory what, I, what I love here, what I love, little did Bush know that Jory Graham would do an analysis of his letter. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's really very beautiful. And, um, you know, it does, it does instill me with hope uh, insofar that there is such a thing as reading carefully insofar that slow reading does provide us with meaning, insofar that there are people for whom this form of analysis is a pleasure. And I think in that pleasure there is the possibility of imagining other worlds and other ways of being. Well, and I hope I, I, well, I hold on I hold on to those shards of hope. <laughs> I really do. But 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 think of think of the words, the nouns that are in just this tiny note. Wonder respect, happiness, loneliness, um, discouragement, success, luck. I mean, you know, those are, that's a pantheon of God, you know, to understand that the word happiness is, I mean, I don't want to be too much of an analysis here, but the word happiness is in the same sentence as the word loneliness. And, you know, he's suddenly evoking Lincoln walking um, the, the hallways of the, of the White House half mad with grief, um, reciting the best. I mean, it's, you know, the, I, I find that line to be extraordinary. I wish you great happiness here. That's another locating device for the poem, for the, uh, for the letter. I never felt the loneliness some presidents have described. So all the prior presidents' ghosts are suddenly summoned there, okay? So the same halls and the loneliness and the absence of, you know, the, Clinton, for all his stupidity, would come to feel the same loneliness. And um, anyway, I found it. I, sometimes it's very interesting when little, you know, when I was a young girl and I was 16, a little younger, no, uh, uh, 14, I think it was, um, the Florence flooded and the whole of the Lycee and other schools in Rome, uh, all the school children were sent up into uh, to Florence to the River Arno um, uh, flooded. And we were part of a large group of, of, of young people who went to help dig things out of the Arno, out of the mud quickly enough so they could be saved. And I've never forgotten putting my hands into the mud. Um, and this is not near the riverbed any longer because the, the water carried mud so far out into the neighboring streets. And, and I felt something hard and I pulled something up and it caught the light and it gleamed for a moment. And it was a manuscript book. It was a, it was a, a book. It was a manuscript. Um, with the gold of the, of the, of the paper edges and the leather <laughs> binding, I pulled it up out of the mud of the river and handed it to the next person who handed it on. Of course, they freeze dried everything and they cleaned them and they rescued a lot of the, of the work of the, of the books that came out of the Uffizi. But I've never, the feeling of bringing this manuscript out of the, out of the, out of the river. Um, there's a little bit the feeling I have of these words, you know, um, I mean, I would rather be reading these words hundreds of years from now and knowing that they're still an institution um, for which these words would be a prior history. But to bring them up out of the river of time, a lonely note written from one man to another as a total private event and to be a witness to it, that's a lot of what a poem is, you know, the one person, one person's extreme solitude um, goes to the depth of whatever their being is and brings forth a thing made of words that another pe person will take as their own um, wisdom and solitude. So, Jory, what a pleasure yeah, it's so, been! Yeah. What a pleasure it's been speaking with you. Really, <laughs> I'm 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 so grateful that I found you in your kitchen, and. Uh, <laughs> And I hope. Uh, we're, Sorry, we went on so long. You'll no, be able. You'll be of able course, to make of course, of course. Not, not, not an issue. It's, it's been a real, real pleasure. Absolutely, and but I, I, I won't edit out um, the the Bush uh, letter because it's there's something 
really wonderful in you in you analyzing it in this way, particularly in our context now. I mean, we understand. Well, I think in this moment when we have lost this, to be reminded that this exists, um, I just wish that everyone could see the little tiny neat handwriting with the black ink on the tiny note paper that says the White House on it and imagines this large desk and this man just before he leaves putting almost a love note it is. down uh, uh, it to is. his opponent. Yeah, it I is. mean, it, it, it's, out of, it's out of Homer. I mean, he leaves the shield on the field for his opponent. Um, you know, I, I give you this shield. He's basically saying, take, you know, protect yourself. They will hurt you. They will criticize you. You will be lonely. Let me give you, I mean, it's a very beautiful thing. And it's most interesting because it's between two men that we're not particularly interested in. Right, exactly. <laughs> Which means exactly. that something miraculous can happen between any two people. They don't have to be heroes or giants or even good. They ha might have goodness in them, even if they've made terrible mistakes, um, which, is, which is in and of itself a form of what democracy is about. Jory, and shame. Jory, <laughs> merci beaucoup. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Bonne soirée. Bonne soirée et à bientôt, j'espère. All the yes. best to you. Oui, merci. Au revoir. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. To support this show and Dublab's progressive programming, go to dublab.com/support.